This rarely describes an individual patient, but at the population level, the rates of breast cancer are highest in the most developed societies, and many people think it relates to these issues of childhood nutrition, pubescent nutrition, number of pregnancies, duration of nursing, and that accounts for a lot of the difference in the incidence rates that we see between, say, the United States and, and other parts of the world. I like to start kind of at the beginning with a little bit of the anatomy. One of the challenges, of course, of diagnosing breast cancer is that you don't get to look directly at the place where the tumor arises the way you do, for example, with colon cancer or skin cancer or cervical cancer, for that matter. It probably behooves us to, to spend some time explaining everything from the embryology to the uh, prepubescent anatomy to the maturation process of the breast and then perhaps even what happens uh, during menopause. So, so, so how would you describe the changes, the development and changes of a breast during a woman's life and uh, with, with, a special, with a specific nod to how this will factor into helping us understand the pathology of breast cancer development during some of those stages? Well, uh, the breast uh, is a gland um, it is fundamentally a sweat gland if you look at the, you know, pure embryology of it. And it is the defining feature of what it is to be a mammal. And as you alluded to, the breast goes through uh, different stages of maturation and development in the life of a woman. And um, it begins as um, sort of a, a quiescent area of tissue. And then during puberty, uh, because of the hormonal changes, uh, develops um, enlargement and maturation of the glands such that they become able to eventually secrete milk if the, if the woman becomes pregnant. And the breast is largely composed of two types of, of uh, tissue. The majority of the volume is actually just fat and nonspecific stromal elements. And the thing that determines the size of the breast in a woman is just really how much non-glandular tissue there is. Um, all women more or less have the same amount of glandular tissue in the breast, the milk generating component of the breast, if you will. And those uh, ducts radiate from the various breast tissues into the nipple, uh, which has uh, multiple orifices. And the God-given purpose here, of course, is to, to nurse the child. Um, and um, breast cancers largely arise from the ductal or the glandular tissue. And in this respect, Breast cancer shares its origins with almost all common cancers, prostate cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, where it is the glandular part of the organ from which arises the malignant cell. Um, one of the interesting things about um, breast cancer and um, normal breast development is that there has been over the past decades a rise in the incidence of breast cancer, the rate of breast cancer. And one of the likely contributors relates to both the early uh, puberty that we are now seeing in women. Um, girls are starting to menstruate at a far younger age um, in the 2020s than they were 100 years ago or certainly 150 years ago, owing probably to better nutrition uh, and better general health. And that uh, means that the breast development and the exposure of the breast to estrogens starts earlier. And women are also menstruating for longer, again, largely owing to uh, better health. And women are having, at the population level, in the developed countries at least, fewer children, and they tend to nurse those children for a shorter duration of time. Again, this rarely describes an individual patient, but at the population level, the rates of breast cancer are highest in the most developed societies. And many people think it relates to these issues of childhood nutrition, uh, pubescent uh, nutrition, number of pregnancies, uh, duration of nursing. And that accounts for a lot of the difference in the incidence rates that we see between, say, the United States and, and other parts of the world. Interestingly, as people shift societies because they move or as other societies become more developed, their rates of breast cancer tend to go up to mirror those of, of the U.S. or you know, Western European populations. Yeah, I, I remember one of the th discussions we had in sort of first year medical school, you know, this is kind of coming up on 30 years ago, um, was the, the study of Japanese women who moved to the United States and within uh, a generation went from very, very low rates of breast cancer to assuming the same rate, the same high rate of breast cancer as American women. Now, of course, I think at least for me, the takeaway of that was, you know, we could never know what the causative driver was, given that there are so many things that are happening. But clearly there's an environmental component to this, right? Whether it's some combination of food, exercise, 
hormones, stress levels, pollution. I mean, you, 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 I don't know what the answer would be, of course, but you, you, you would have a very long list of things that could change that could amount for such a dramatic shift, as opposed to saying, for example, there's genetic differences that are accounting for this when we're, we're obviously going to talk at length about the genetic drivers of this, but, uh, but that wouldn't explain the one generation shift, of course. Well, that's right. And, you know, back to the 19th century, one of the first cancer epidemiological findings was that nuns who never became pregnant were at greater risk for developing breast cancer. And along with the discovery of um, uh, scrotal cancers in chimney sweeps, it was one of the first real steps forward in the epidemiology of cancer biology to help people begin to get a sense of, of what uh, was causing cancer. And so I think you make a good point that the uh, environment, by, by which I don't specifically mean like the atmosphere or the pollutants or all those kinds right. of things, but the, the environment in which a person grows up is, is going to have an impact on their breast cancer risk. Now, the dilemma here is that for any given individual, we almost never have a good sense of what their intrinsic risk of breast cancer is, aside from, and I'm sure we'll get to this, the family history and genetic cancers, and why they get breast cancer now and why they got it in one breast and not the other breast, and all those things remain very mysterious. And for someone who takes care of breast cancer patients, it's a source of real frustration. There are some tumors where we really think we understand why they're at greater risk. You know, the smoking and lung cancer story or uh, other things. People sort of say, well, you know, I, I, at least you can imagine how this arose. Whereas breast cancer is often a disease of very healthy women, uh, women who have gone to great lengths to care for themselves. And despite that, they are encountering a breast cancer diagnosis, which is, is often frustrating. Mm -hmm. 